Never since the 1960s has humanity been so fixated on the heavens. The countdown to Friday's launch of SpaceX Dragon Crew from Cape Canaveral in Florida, just one small step on the road to returning to the moon, man trip to Mars, and much more. We'll ask about this mission and the first Frenchman to return to space, uh, Thomas Pesquet. We'll also ask what it's all about, a noble thirst for knowledge or imperialism's new frontier, just as the Industrial Revolution begat the scramble for Africa and the colonization of vast swathes of Asia, the digital age comes with a scramble for the stars. It's not just about flag waving. There are strategic partnerships between governments and private contractors. Note, for instance, that Elon Musk's, Musk's SpaceX offers reusable rocket launchers, while separately it's engaged in a fierce battle to position its Starlink satellites in low Earth orbit. Whoever controls space, does that uh, person or does that country control our planet? Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at the scramble for space. Joining us from The Hague, Kirsten MacDonald, who is head of experiment planning at the European Space Agency, also spokesperson for Mission Alpha, which is uh, blasting off on Friday. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Jill Stewart's a consultant on politics, ethics, and the law of outer space exploration, works with the London School of Economics. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. And to help us navigate between the romance of this topic and the hard science, who better than an acclaimed science fiction writer? Franco-Danish author Victor Dixon has seen his Phobos series translated in multiple languages. Thank you for joining us from Washington. Thank you for having me. The France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. Yeah, NASA taking no chances, pushing back the launch by 24 hours to Friday. Let's go live to Cape Canaveral and France 24's uh, Kedavan uh, Gorgistani. This time it looks like it's on. Yes, it seems like it's on, but of course, uh, until the very last minute, it could uh, be canceled. But uh, NASA is pretty confident uh, that everything will be in order for that launch uh, tomorrow morning, 5.49 a.m. local time here in Cape Canaveral, 11.49 a.m. Paris time. Uh, this delay, of course, is uh, because the motto of NASA, of course, is safety first, not taking any risks. And uh, yesterday and today, actually, as you can see, the weather is uh, pretty nice. There's uh, quite a bit of wind, but uh, the weather here was nice. But that is because there's not only the launch site that you have to take into account when you consider uh, the weather. There's the whole flight path and uh, the recovery area because uh, that capsule, that Dragon capsule in which the four astronauts will be sitting in at the top of that Falcon 9 rocket, uh, well, that uh, capsule can eject uh, while uh, that rocket is taking off if there is a problem. And so if they manage to to eject and uh, they uh, land at sea, uh, you want to make sure that that area, that recovery area, doesn't see uh, really bad storms or a very bad sea because that would make the recovery of uh, the astronauts a little bit more complicated. So that is why uh, this uh, launch was delayed uh, to tomorrow morning, uh, uh, tomorrow morning, 5.49, as I said. Uh, that will be uh, the big launch and everyone here at the Kennedy uh, Space Center is really uh, gearing up. We're all very excited. This delay has uh, sort of uh, stopped us in our, our tracks, but I was speaking uh, to uh, astronaut Andreas Mogensen. He happens uh, to have trained with Thomas Pesquet, and he's extremely good friends with uh, Thomas, and he was uh, telling me that uh, this uh, delay had maybe added the sense of urgency and of excitement because these astronauts have been preparing for months, for years for uh, this mission. And now they, uh, he was saying that they probably just want to get going. They want to sit in that capsule and they want to go off to space to the International Space Station. Are they, are they just waiting around? What, what happens in those last 24 hours? Well, originally, uh, if you uh, took the initial uh, schedule, everything was really uh, done uh, to the minute. They had a very uh, clear uh, schedule. The extra 24 hours gave them a little bit of extra downtime because, of course, all the technical stuff 
uh, all of that has been rehearsed time and time again. They had actually the uh, dress rehearsal, the real dress rehearsal took place over the weekend. Uh, so now it's simply uh, waiting, saying your last goodbyes, spending a little bit of time with uh, their families, uh, doing also a lot of uh, media uh, comments. Uh, they're talking to all the journalists who are here because there are plenty of uh, reporters, a lot of French reporters, a lot of Japanese reporters, because uh, Thomas Pesquet was We'll have a Japanese uh, crew member, Aki uh, Oshide, on top of uh, the two Americans, of course, uh, Shane Kimbrough and uh, Megan uh, MacArthur. Uh, so uh, they're really uh, gearing up for uh, that flight. And one uh, interesting uh, point to note is that one of uh, the new traditions uh, for SpaceX is that uh, these astronauts get to uh, choose uh, one of their last meals on Earth, uh, choosing whatever they really crave for. And apparently, uh, we were told that Thomas Pesquet uh, chose uh, to get uh, chicken, roasted chicken, uh, with mashed potato. And of course, he's French, so he asked uh, for a plateau de fromage, a cheese plate with some fresh uh, French baguette and uh, some ice cream in dessert. Uh, this is uh, their last good meal on Earth, of course, once you're into space. It's not always as delicious, though uh, they are getting to take a few a good meal, some meals cooked by uh, French chef Thierry Marx uh, for Thomas Pesquet, who is, of course, uh, under a lot of pressure from his uh, crew uh, members as a Frenchman to uh, really deliver on French cuisine. Yeah, I'm told he's going to have to make boeuf bourguignon for the rest of the crew. Kedivan Gorgistani, who will be covering that, uh, uh, that launch on uh, Friday for us live. Many thanks uh, for, for that update. Uh, Kirsten McDowell, I won't ask you how you make uh, boeuf bourguignon in space, but uh, it just, it, it, it is a reminder, this this 24-hour delay, that uh, it's, it's dangerous stuff going, uh, going blasting off to space. Yes, it is dangerous, <laughs> but... Uh... All of this is really timed extremely well as when you take into account also the flight path. And we want to ensure that the vehicle rendezvous and docks to the space station um, in the most uh, fuel efficient to, um, uh, fuel efficient way to arrive to the space station safely. Okay, so taking no chances, as we've said, uh, let's listen to uh, to Thomas Pesquet, uh, 43 years old, Frenchman, second trip to the uh, uh, International Space Station. Uh, he, uh, he went up once in a Soyuz. This time it's a SpaceX Falcon. He hails what he calls this golden age of manned flights. It's about preparing the next steps of space exploration, because obviously this is what the space station is all about. We can go through the scales, go through the motions, develop new technology to take us beyond the moon, Mars, and that's what everyone's talking about at the moment. Is that really the idea, Kirsten McDonald? Yes, it really is. So um, when we go to the International Space Station, that's in low Earth orbit, and it really serves as a platform that will then later enable exploration to Moon and Mars. By sending astronauts to um, low Earth orbit and, and sending them there for six months at a time, we can really understand how the human body can counteract the effects of microgravity, what's required for longer duration missions, so that eventually when we want to take a longer trip to Mars, we have all the information we need to ensure that we can sustain their lives throughout the entire trip. But that's already happened since the ISS has been up there since 1980. Uh, don't you already have that information? Well, we're I said still 1980, learning I meant 2000, more excuse about, me. Uh, <laughs> yes, I was going to correct you. Yeah. So indeed, uh, the ISS has been up there. We've had human presence for the past 20 years, uh, nonstop human presence on ISS. But there's still quite a lot to be learned. We're still discovering with uh, more up-to-date technology, um, uh, more recent experiments, that uh, the effects on, on the human body are not still 100% understood. And uh, we also want to ensure that uh, we use ISS as a test bed to essentially enable exploration when we go to Moon and Mars. Yeah, the ISS, which uh, is a joint project that brings together uh, really uh, the, the big space agencies, uh, not just Europe and the United States, but of course also 
uh, Russia and before the moon and Mars, uh, the, the, the ISS is that uh, springboard, as Kirsten was saying. Um, its retirement recently was pushed back to 2030. Chris Moore has that story. These days, the ISS is devoted entirely to scientific research, but it was politics which drove its creation. US President Ronald Reagan launched the project in 1984, but by the turn of the decade, it was sidelined as the Americans prioritised their shuttle programme. But everything changed in 1991, when the collapse of the Soviet Union left its space programme in disarray. Among the scientists who'd worked on it, missile specialists. And the West's great fear that they'd sell their services elsewhere, at a time when countries like Iran, Libya and North Korea had nuclear ambitions. Il y a eu une crainte que les, que les compétences se fassent un peu siphonner côté Russie, surtout qu'ils étaient dans une situation à l'époque très difficile au niveau économique. Je ne sais pas si, si l'objectif c'était de récupérer des personnes, gagner en compétences, oui, pour sûr. And it was thanks to the Russian skills used to launch eight space stations that the ISS project was reborn. On November the 20th, 1998, 400 kilometers above Earth, work began on this mechanical giant, a 400 tonne structure the size of a football pitch. 110 metres long, 74 wide, 30 high. The largest artificial object in orbit took 13 years to build. Far above our heads, it travels at 27,600 kilometres an hour, a speed which prevents it from falling to Earth and allows the astronauts inside to maintain weightlessness. Ownership of the ISS was spread across agencies according to the contribution of each, and a tightly controlled exchange system was put in place. On est copropriétaire, donc il faut savoir se partager les frais de la station. Alors ces frais, ça pourrait être payé en, en argent, mais euh, plus intelligemment, on fait ce qu'on appelle des barters, c'est-à-dire effectivement des trocs, où on développe du matériel, on développe des capacités de ravitaillement, et on paye donc notre loyer, quelque part, par ce biais-là. For several years, Europe paid its rent by developing a vehicle to move freight and an observation platform. In return, NASA supplied free transport. The ISS has now been permanently staffed since October the 31st, 2000, and is set to be for some time yet. Its mission has just been extended until 2030. So, Jill Stewart, uh, the, the ISS, it's sort of true to... Uh, remember the old TV series in Star Trek when you had everybody on the crew from different nationalities all banding together? For, in your head, is that still the spirit of the ISS? I would like to think so. I mean, the International Space Station has, as your uh, presentation there just said, long played a role in, in diplomacy and really in showing up relationships between the countries that are participating in it. Uh, that's not to say that it isn't immune to political tensions. And, uh, you know, we have, for example, seen the fact that China hasn't been invited to participate in the station. But I believe that for the astronauts in particular and the cosmonauts, uh, once they are on board, there is a sense of, of camaraderie and that sort of international cooperative uh, uh, essence. In your view, should India, China be invited? That's a very difficult question. I mean, at this point, uh, China has its own space station, and it has also just last month stated plans to co uh, collaborate with Russia in order to uh, establish a lunar base. And so, regardless of my own opinions on it, I suppose I do think that they, we are going to increasingly see more of a, a sort of breakaway between China and Russia and um, other allied powers. I believe that India is, however, potentially a, a, a good partner, a strategic partner for organizations like NASA. You heard at the outset our reporter, Kedivan Gorgistani in Florida, uh, describing uh, uh, the flock of French and Japanese journalists because one of their own is going up on Friday. But what is the significance of this mission at this point in time? Well, for one, I think a lot of people are talking about the fact that it's the second time that the SpaceX capsule will be taking uh, the crew up there. So it's a, uh, it demonstrates the United States has space capabilities again, but also that it's relying on a, a private company, although a, a publicly funded in many ways, but a private company to access the space station. So I think that really reflects a wider movement towards commercial activity in outer space. Uh, and I, yeah. Space activity does tend to inspire um, nationalism, and that's one of the reasons why countries have traditionally used it for propaganda purposes. So that's not to put a, a negative spin on the fact that people from Japan and France are excited about this, but there is sort of a political subtext to it.
a political subtext uh, to it. Uh, is that how you see it, Victor Dixon? Uh, well, there is, yes, because uh, we, we talked about space exploration being a big experiment. Uh, what is the effect of space on the human body? It's also a political experiment. It was said before, you know, uh, about uh, human cooperation. So I think this is, uh, this is at stake, uh, definitely. And also the, the fact that for the first time we have a private company participating in space exploration that's very new too. It's the politics and economic world colliding, you know, in, in order to achieve the same goal. Uh, in my novel Phobos, I try to imagine a future where NASA itself has been privatized. Uh, it has become private. And uh, space exploration is entirely a private uh, thing, which is a possibility for the future. Uh, does it bother you, the fact that there are uh, private contractors, in this case, uh, Elon Musk's SpaceX? No, I think it's, uh, it's a promise of, uh, we can be quite hopeful about that because it's more energies uh, gathering towards the same objective. But of course, the question we'll raise about uh, how we control it and uh, how it, be it's, it remains a democratic debate. You know, if it's entirely privatized, then uh, it's the, this, this dream of mankind for space uh, could become the dream of one man. And that would be obviously a problem. Kirsten McDonald, of course, the the amazing thing about SpaceX is the advent of the age of the reusable rocket, and that cuts costs by a lot. Yes, indeed. And actually, on this uh, Crew 2 vehicle, uh, Megan MacArthur is flying in the same capsule her husband flew in in the initial crewed test flight. Bob, Gep He was the astronaut Bob Behnken. So uh, I do think that it, it is a, it's the direction that we should all be going in when it comes to sustainability and uh, circular economies. So this is really an example of uh, the way we should move to in, in all our developments in the future. Kirsten, we have a question for you because uh, when you, we talked about the different missions coming up, in their baggage aboard Crew Dragon, there's going to be Phasarum polycephalum, a.k.a four petri dishes of what's being described as blob, uh, neither animal, plant, nor fungus. Uh, w what's with the blob going up into space? <laughs> yeah, it, it's, uh, it is a, a unique experiment. They want to understand it actually has, seems to have a, a mind of its own and um, they want to see how it reacts uh, on orbit. It can actually um, seek out its own food. And, uh, and with the absence of uh, gravity, we're very curious to see how it will behave in microgravity on the International Space Station. All right. Uh, and is, I want to pick up on this with Victor Dixon. We have to take a quick break because uh, the, this idea of the blob, it leaves some people a little bit uneasy. We'll talk about it when we come back. Stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate. <laughs> Welcome back, or welcome if you're just joining us. Uh, we're counting down to uh, SpaceX's launch on Friday from uh, Cape Canaveral. It's one of uh, several, uh, of a lot. there's a lot of uh, frenzy of activity right now that are taking place in the skies. And uh, by the way, what goes up must come down. Last week, it was the turn of three other uh, uh, astronauts to return to Earth aboard a Soyuz rocket, NASA astronaut and microbiologist. Kate Rubens, along with Russian cosmonauts Sergei Rizikov and Sergei Kujshverkov, they're landed in Kazakhstan. Uh, we're talking about it with Kirsten McDonald, head of experiment planning at the European Space Agency, and who is the spokesperson for Mission Alpha, which uh, is that mission to uh, the International uh, Space Station. Thanks for being with us from The Hague. Jill Stewart, consultant on politics, ethics and law, and who works with the London School of Economics uh, uh, and is uh, joining us from London and to help us navigate uh, uh, all of this as well, acclaimed science fiction writer uh, Victor Dixon. Your Phobos series has been translated into, ver into several languages. Uh, Victor, we were talking just before the break about, you know, ex these experiments taking uh, uh, petri dishes of uh, what we described as blob uh, 
uh, up to the ISS. Are these the kinds of things you think about when you write? Well, as a science fiction writer, I try to imagine things that have not happened yet. And uh, when I started to write the Phobos series in 2014, uh, mm -hmm. Mars was all over the news. You know, I, I could feel the excitement. It was like the moon in the 60s, the next frontier. So I, I told to myself, I have to imagine how it could happen before it happens in real time. And we just seen before in this, uh, in this debate that uh, NASA says they're going to send humans on the planet Mars in the next 15 years. So it's really around the corner. So I try to imagine what could happen. And for instance, the consequences of a long stay in space on the human body, uh, this has been discussed before too. I try to imagine pregnancy, for instance. What would it be to, to have babies in, in space uh, or in a very low gravity environment such as Mars? So this is really the matter of what I try to explore in the, in the Phobos series. Um, yeah, so that's, you know, I, I try to, to use the facts, and we have more and more scientific facts, to fuel the imagination. For instance, when I started to write the Phobos series, we did not know there was some water in a liquid state on Mars. And since then, NASA has discovered that there is a liquid water on Mars. So I had to incorporate this fact in the further books. And uh, before in these debates, we also learned that now it's possible to make oxygen on Mars, which is, of course, wonderful news, not only to breathe, but also to fuel, to, to have a rocket uh, able to come back to, to Earth. And when I, I started to, uh, to write the Phobos novel, it was not possible. So my characters in the, in the novel, they have a one-way trip to Mars. They live forever. They know they will never be able to come back to Earth. But thanks to technology, and technology progress is, uh, is going very fast, it may be able to do so in the future. Yeah, uh, uh, reality uh, I imitating fiction this week for sure. Uh, the wow factor very high when it comes to Mars, even though the humanoids haven't arrived yet. Uh, on Monday, NASA's uh, uh, Perseverance mission uh, successfully doing a landing and takeoff of a miniature robot helicopter. Uh, ingenuity remote controlled from planet Earth. There you see the images, they're quite impressive there. And then uh, it's what you just heard Victor describe on Wednesday. It's called MOXI, which stands for Mars Oxygen In Situ Resource Utilization Experiment. It is a six wheeled robot. It converted a sample of the red planet's carbon dioxide rich atmosphere into precious uh, oxygen. Mars's atmosphere, 95% carbon dioxide, one tenth of 1% oxygen. So you certainly would need a machine like that, Kirsten McDonald, uh, if you did send humans uh, uh, to Mars. Uh, listening to Victor, do you get the sense sometimes that you do as head of uh, experiment planning at the European Space Agency, kind of the same job, imagining what if? Yeah, that is a big part of it. Uh, there's such a huge variety of science that we're currently studying on the space station. We mentioned uh, human research, but we have so much more to learn in biology, in material sciences, in radiation physics and environmental sciences, as well as fluid physics. So um, just, just understanding what are the big questions, uh, what will it take to not only get us there, but sustain life there? Um, there's really so many things to answer, and uh, we want to make sure that we prioritize answering the most important questions when we do go. Why has there been this push, and you heard Victor describe it, over the last decade? Why do we suddenly want to uh, send humans back to the moon uh, when it's a lot safer just to send uh, robots? That human element, uh, there, there's still this, um, you know, complexity of the human brain that uh, a robot that, and right now just cannot match. And uh, I do see that in the initial uh, phases, we will have uh, robotic exploration at first, uh, then humans orbiting uh, the moon and, and Mars and potentially controlling robots. But the, the ability to troubleshoot, the fact that uh, communication delays will take so long to have a human team in the room, in, in, uh, in situ, to be able to troubleshoot and uh, repair any kind of equipment that requires it uh, really will be required if we want to further exploration. Yeah, because it's how many light minutes away between Mars and Earth? Uh, I 
That I won't be able to answer. I don't recall off the top of my head. But, but enough so that experiments take a lot longer if it's a robot than if it's a human. Uh, the, yes, it, well, exactly. That's not just that, but it's also the, yeah, the delay in communication. We really will need to be more autonomous uh, in, uh, in the experiments we want to perform there. So uh, having a team of uh, not only uh, some robots to support, but then also humans with their feet on the moon is really the future goal. Jill Stewart, is that how you see it, that this is in the name of science that we need to send humans back into space? I don't think that it's an either or. It's either for science or it is for politics. Uh, without wanting to be sort of a, a killjoy, I do think that there is also a political element to it. Being able to have a crude, capable um, program demonstrates that a country has a strong economy, that it has, um, it's at the forefront of technology, and that it has sort of strong political backing. And it also is in a leadership position within the international community because these projects are absolutely going to be collaborative going into the future. Part because of their expense. Um, and there's also just sort of a romantic element of wanting to have humans in space. There are some people in the science community who think we should only be doing robotic exploration because it's cheaper and so we can sort of get more for our money. Um, but I do think there is, there is um, something unique about having humans up there that is both scientific but also sort of philosophical and political. Okay, the, let's talk about those politics. Uh, with plans to try and return uh, humans to the moon by 2024. Uh, the United States' new president, Joe Biden, following up a project that was launched by his predecessor, Donald Trump, and his vice president, Mike Pence, announcing Artemis late in 2017. And it was followed up last October with the signing of the Artemis Accords with eight U.S. allies. That's drawn criticism. What with mining rights at the heart uh, of that uh, pact, uh, uh, it's about uh, divvying up the rights to mine for uh, rare materials, Jill Stewart? Well, it is very complicated, but I think the, the base of this is that there's a very long-standing international legal regime that governs outer space, and it's been around since the 1960s. And the most important of those treaties, which has been very widely ratified and is very widely respected, it's sometimes referred to as the Constitution for Outer Space, said specifically that no nation state may lay claim to celestial territory. And so as we're getting to this point here where resource extraction uh, for in situ utilization is possible, there's some uh, dis disputes about this, really. So, um, but having said that, I think there is a sense that because we are getting to the point where this is going to be a technological reality, a scientific reality, that there's a need to unpack exactly what was meant by that treaty. I mean, for example, the Apollo missions did bring back a lot of, of moon materials. So it's not that uh, outer space resources have never been extracted. It's just what we ethically and politically feel about this, because I don't think we want to have another situation where we have um, destroyed the surface of another planet, so we need to proceed carefully. What has happened recently is that in 2015, the United States unilaterally passed the Commercial Space Act, which said that uh, American companies could claim resources that they, uh, that they extracted in space, but it was controversial. Luxembourg has also passed similar legislation. What the Artemis Accords did was to take a softer approach to this and ask for countries to join, and uh, with this understanding around how resource extraction action would occur, but that very much embedded in the language of sustainability and also transparency and cooperation. Having said that, it certainly hasn't been without controversy. Uh, China and Russia have notably not signed up to the accords, and so we have yet to see how effective this is going to be as a piece of, of governance and legislation. All right, so there, so there, there are high stakes uh, when it comes to the moon, when it comes to Mars. Uh, Victor Dixon, last week, SpaceX owner Elon Musk uh, sent out a tweet. He said, if we make life multiplanetary, there may come a day when some plants and animals die out on Earth but are still alive on Mars. Your reaction to that? <laughs> Well, it's very true, you know, um, we, our French president Emmanuel Macron say there is no planet B. Uh, there may be actually uh, in the future uh, some other planets, some backup plans uh, to, uh, to save biodiversity. But there is one word that came back often in this debate and that very, is very interesting, is sustainability. Uh, it's true that if uh, human uh, life has to thrive on Mars, 
it will have to be sustainable, uh, extracting the resources to live on the planet itself. We're talking about water, we talked about oxygen, but there is also one more thing to space conquest, is that it brings us back to Earth. You know what, there's something that strikes me very much. Uh, when astronauts, they first go to space, they all have the same testimony. They all say that from space, they can see how precious, how unique and fragile the, the Earth, the blue planet is. So I think that by exploring other planets, uh, it brings us back also to uh, saving and keeping our planet, the cradle of the human species. So sustainability is, is all around space conquests. And it's also, um, I think, a goal that can gather uh, the human species. We were talking before about the interest to have uh, human beings on Mars because, because they can react quicker than robots. And by the way, if, if I remember well, the, the time transmission between uh, Earth and Mars uh, varies between three minutes and 45 minutes, depending on the distance between the two planets. Uh, so it's important to have human beings for technical reasons, but also for the romantic aspect, as it was said before, you know, for, for the dream, uh, to have a goal that unites us, uh, not only in space, but also here on Earth. Uh, because that's humanity looking at itself? Or is it because, well, we're just primitive animals who, who want to conquer everything we see, including the stars? Well, it's a mix. You know, human being is a complex creature. And uh, when, when you ask this question, it brings, in my memory, images of a uh, Stanley Kubrick movie, you know, uh, 201 a Space Odyssey, which is, uh, it starts with uh, monkeys, you know, uh, fighting against each, each other. And then you have another uh, shot about space, space exploration, all the satellites around Earth. And that's the complexity of, uh, of our species. We have these instincts uh, and uh, we have these dreams and we have to, to work with both of them to achieve things. At this point in time, uh, Kirsten McDonald, at the um, European Space Agency, how much time is devoted to what we're talking about? Uh, um, lofty goals of manned missions to the outer heavens, to the, to the moon, to Mars. And how much is devoted, well, to the atmosphere, where right now it's getting super crowded. What with uh, all these satellites uh, that are there, there's going to be more on the way. Uh, Elon Musk is one of those uh, vying to put more satellites up in the lower atmosphere. For the ESA, which is the priority? Uh, it's very hard to say what the priority is. It's certainly split. Um, we still have a huge requirement for um, maintaining our presence in low Earth orbit and uh, certainly for um, purposes for observing the Earth itself and for communications. Uh, we will continue to have satellites in low Earth orbit. Um, but then uh, we also want to further exploration. So to put a, 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 a try and balance uh, how much priority is going in either direction, I would say that there, there are various directorates working on a bit of both. A bit of both. So it's, um, it's a really tricky question to answer. <laughs> Where are the stakes higher, Jill Stewart, at this point? Uh, well, when well, you mentioned space debris, I, I would say so because of the of how much is up there. Having said that, we have gotten better technologically at making sure that satellites have an end of life uh, cycle so that they destroy themselves at the end of their utility. So uh, we have made some progress with that, but there is still this issue. And, and the big concern that you hear people talking about is something called the Kessler effect, which is the idea, if you saw the movie Gravity, it was uh, portrayed very well there, that if, if there was a bad collision, it could create a debris cloud that would have a knock-on effect. And because we have become so reliant on space infrastructure, it could really be devastating even for safety of life applications such as airline navigation. But it could also take out big sectors of our global economy, for example, which rely on satellites. And so, yes, in many ways, I think the stakes are a lot higher when, it talks, when we talk about debris. But we're also a lot more aware of it and working on ways to uh, not only make sure that what goes up now comes back down, but to start thinking about the removal uh, or, or deorbiting of some objects that are up there already. Because you heard Victor earlier in the conversation talking about how we, go, we look out to the heavens when we're here, and once we're up there, we look back down towards Earth. Uh, how much of your uh, time as somebody who works on the legality of space is devoted to this issue of what happens right or just around the planet in our outer atmosphere? 
Well, absolutely, I completely agree with Victor. I mean, we, we search the universe to discover ourselves. So as we look out, we definitely look back in and we reflect back in. And so, um, yeah, there is a lot of concern about what what we are doing out there and how that sort of reconstitutes our politics on Earth. I think the environment is a good example. Uh, this idea that it was first when we went into space, as we, we thought we were looking out, but what we actually saw was our fragile planet, which is attribu uh, attributed with in, uh, advancing the environmental movement. But then ironically, now we are creating environmental problems in space. And that's why I think, again, it's important to think about things like resource extraction and settlement on other planets. But uh, there, there is sort of a feedback between uh, looking out and looking back in, certainly. And when you hear about rival projects uh, for things like uh, manned missions to the moon, how does the future seem? Uh, I think competition has always been a driver of space activity, and it most likely always will be a political competition between countries. Now you also have things like companies that are competing for segments of a very lucrative industrial market. So I don't. I think it would be naive to think that we can get away from that element of it. To some degree, it's about trying to contain uh, the weaponization of space. For example, uh, you could say that it, it's it's sometimes a bit useful in, in terms of driving space activity and space technology if you are um, absolutely in favor of that as an end in and of itself. But it is definitely balanced at the same time by the scientific community. And there's, again, again with this looking out and, and reconstituting back in, in a lot of ways when we cooperate in outer space, it shores up cooperative relationships on Earth. Victor Dixon, now as we look ahead to that countdown on Friday, what captures your imagination the most? Well, it's uh, just uh, looking what's going to happen live because, you know, as you said before, reality uh, goes faster than fiction these days. You know, the, the space uh, conquest is happening. So it's fascinating to see it happening and try to imagine what could come next. So it's a bit of a race for a writer as, uh, as I am. And uh, for instance, uh, Jill was mentioning the Kessler effect, which is a very real uh, problem that's you know, it's just the beginning now of the pollution of uh, near-Earth orbits, but it could uh, accelerate in the years to come. So that's something I try to explore in my novel. I try to, to imagine a Kessler effect gone, gone uh, wild and that could maybe even prevent any further uh, flights from Earth. You know, if the near-Earth orbit is so polluted, we may never be able to leave our, our planet again. So that's where science fiction can help. And, you know, I, I'm always looking at the news, looking at uh, the technological advances and try to imagine what could happen. And that's what I will be doing tomorrow, uh, watching uh, the, the launch. Krista okay, McDonald, we're out of time. So just very briefly, what uh, do you see? Uh, what's your pet obsession as you as you prepare to watch that launch? My pet obsession. <laughs> well, I what I love is the when you mentioned this uh, this buzz around the launch, uh, the fact that there will be so many young people watching it, and that it might stimulate them to go into studying uh, science and technology, engineering, or mathematics. Kristen McDonald, I want to thank you so much for joining us from The Hague. Jill Stewart from London, Victor Dixon uh, from Washington. And yes, our coverage will be live here on France 24 Friday from 8 a.m. Paris time. That's 2 a.m. if you're watching on the east coast of the United States. Well, thank you for joining us here in this edition of the France 24 debate.